Oh, hi, I'm Mr. Beat. I'm busy at work, as you can see. Uh, well, I'm pretending to be working at least. Yeah, these are blank pages. Seriously, though, I'm at work right now, which is why I'm wearing a button-up shirt, even though I hate wearing button-up shirts. In addition to being a YouTube media sensation, I still teach high school social studies. As you probably already knew, teaching is a very demanding job. My students have already left for the day, but I'm still here grading, checking emails, and planning lessons for the next day. In the United States, there's a misconception that teachers, quote, have it easy because they, quote, have the summers off. But if you add up all the hours an average American teacher works each year, they still end up averaging more than 42 hours a week, which is just about what the average American works a week. And that sounds about right because the 40 hour work week is pretty much the standard for most American jobs today. Now, as a teacher, I get paid a salary and I don't get paid by the hour which means I get paid on a regular basis no matter how many hours I work each day or week. But did you know that most Americans are hourly workers? Yep, around 59% of Americans get paid by the hour. Fortunately for them, thanks to the Fair Labor Standards Act, they get overtime pay if they work more than 40 hours in one week. For each hour over 40 hours worked in a week, they get one and one half times their regular rates of pay. Hold up, hold up. Why do we work 40 hours a week or eight hours a day? Where the heck does that come from? Well, throughout most of human history, the work schedule was more fluid. Take the hunter-gatherers. Hunters hunted when they needed to hunt. Gatherers gathered when they needed to, you know, gather. And then once agriculture became a big deal, farmers plowed their fields, planted their seeds, harvested their crops, and fed their animals as needed. Even today, it's rather ridiculous to think of farmers clocking into work at nine o'clock and clocking out at five. If anything, there are times of the year where they are just constantly working. And then came the first industrial revolution. You know, that huge transition in world history where for the first time, fewer and fewer things were made by hand and instead made by machines, leading to bigger and bigger factories to produce them? The thing is, those machines helped, but factory owners still greatly relied on the productivity of their workers. Without their workers, they would be screwed, as those expensive machines would just be collecting dust. So factory owners kept their factories open all day long and forced or I mean asked their workers to work as much as possible. This led to the average factory worker working 90 hours a week. Since the work week was usually six days a week for most workers, 90 hours a week averages out to 15 hours a day. Basically the workers would work and sleep. Work, sleep, work, sleep. Oh, I guess they had to eat somewhere in there. What's crazy is that the better the technology got, the harder the workers had to work. In the early days of the first industrial revolution, workers had more leverage, so it wasn't as intense. However, when more and more struggling farmers fled the countryside to the cities to seek work in the early 1800s, soon there were too many available workers, and so factory owners now had the leverage. And yeah, this is why they began to get away with treating their workers like crap. Factory conditions sucked. Often factories were poorly ventilated, so the air was dirty. They were also poorly lit. Workers were on their feet all day. And since the machines were often very dangerous, all of this combined led to many injuries on the job. Of course, back then, if you got hurt on the job, you couldn't work anymore. So you just lost your job and there was no compensation, no medical insurance. Not only that, but wages were so low that sometimes women and children also had to step in so that families could make enough money to survive. Children as young as five years old worked in factories. Needless to say, eventually the workers began to unite to demand better working conditions. After all, the factory owners would be screwed if all of them decided not to go into work, and thus the labor union 
Union was born. Before I get into unions, this video is once again sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem-solving based website and app with a hands-on approach with over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science. Brilliant puzzles you, surprises you, and expands your understanding of the modern world. Brilliant is the best education site I've seen for developing critical reasoning skills. I'm typically not a math or science guy, and many of you watching maybe aren't too. However, maybe if this was around when I was in school, I would have enjoyed math and science so much more. As I tried it out, I was amazed with how I didn't even realize my brain was being exercised. Go to brilliant.org slash Mr. Beat and sign up for free. Also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Okay. As far back as 1791, Philadelphia carpenters went on strike, refusing to go to work until they got a 10-hour workday. The 8-hour workday, however, had its origins in Great Britain. Today, we can give a lot of credit to this dude, Robert, Robert Owen. Owen. Owen was a wealthy industrialist, but was also one of the supposed original socialists, man. You know, before Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels came around and made it trendy. Anyway, in 1810, Owen had proposed proposed a 10-hour workday for his own workers he managed in a big textile mill. By 1817, Owen was now all about the 8-hour workday, coming up with the slogan, 8 hours labor, 8 hours recreation, 8 hours rest. I mean, it sounds logical, right? Divide the day up into thirds, a third of the day working, a third of the day playing, and a third of the day sleeping. Too bad many adults today spend that third of supposed playtime working, eh? But I digress. So the eight-hour workday started to catch on, especially in Great Britain, which passed a law in 1833 that limited the work for children in factories. Yep, those aged 9 through 13 could only work eight hours a day. Jeez. I guess there's a lot more to this story. Meanwhile, across the pond, workers were beginning to organize and demanding reform. In 1835, once again, we returned to Philadelphia, where they organized the first general strike in North America, led by Irish coal workers. Their banner said, quote, from six to six, 10 hours work and two hours for meals. Over the next few years, various American labor movement publications called specifically for an eight hour work Day. In the 1840s and 1850s, certain workers amazingly got the eight-hour workday in New Zealand and Australia. However, this was an anomaly. In 1866, William, William Silvis, Silvis founded the National Labor Union, and one of their first demands to the United States Congress was to get them to pass a law mandating an eight-hour workday. The law never passed, but their efforts further popularized the idea. On May 19, 1869, U.S. President Ulysses Grant issued a proclamation calling for an eight-hour workday for government workers. It was during the second Industrial Revolution that the idea of an eight-hour workday really gained steam. Get it? Steam? That was bad, I know. In the 1870s, new labor organizations like the Knights of Labor and the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions of the United States and Canada made the eight-hour workday their main cause. 1886 was a big year in labor rights history. That year, the Illinois legislature passed a law mandating eight-hour workdays. However, many employers were like, nuh -uh, not gonna do it, which led to huge worker strikes throughout Chicago. On May 1st, Albert, Albert Parsons, Parsons, who led the Chicago branch of the Knights of Labor, and his wife Lucy, Lucy Parsons, Parsons, led a march of 80,000 protesters down Michigan Avenue in Chicago in what today is known as the first modern May Day Parade. They chanted, quote, eight hour day with no cut in pay. This led to a huge nationwide strike of 350,000 workers at 1,200 factories. On May 3rd, things got tense when workers on strike and those who were still trying to go to work started to fight. The police arrived and ended up killing four people. At another rally the next day to protest this violence, a bomb exploded at the Haymarket Square. In the hysteria, police rounded up hundreds of labor activists 
including Albert Parsons, and charged them with a conspiracy to set off the bomb. To this day, we don't know who actually set off that bomb, but Parsons was among those executed for conspiracy. This all today is simply known as the Haymarket Haymarket Affair. Affair. Many consider those executed in the Haymarket Affair martyrs, as their cause became even more widespread afterward. Over the next few decades, more and more workers got the eight-hour workday all around the world, starting with mostly women and children. Despite that, in 1890, full-time manufacturing workers were working an average of 100 hours a week. Goodness. It was the progressive era that finally made the eight-hour workday not such a radical thing. It didn't happen all at once. There wasn't one single event that shifted everything dramatically to it. It was incremental. I will say, though, that Spain became the very first country in the world to introduce a law restricting the workday to a maximum of eight hours for everyone doing any kind of work on April 3rd, 1919. Also, give some credit to Henry Ford, who was a pretty shady character on other issues, but with labor, he was ahead of the curve. On September 25th, 1926, Ford Motor Company officially adopted a five-day, 40-hour work week. Wait a second, a five-day work week? That's madness. Are you telling me they got both Saturday and Sunday off? If I didn't know any better, I think that sounded like a weekend. Yes, weekends weren't really a thing until the 1920s and 1930s. Did your head just explode? I mean, sure, British workers had been talking about the need to have two days off in a row as early as the 1800s, but only in the 1920s, and after so many workers and laws started demanding it, did companies finally go along with it. In 1930, the influential British economist John, John Maynard, Maynard Keynes Kane. even predicted that rising productivity due to technology would shrink the average work week to just 15 hours. Well, obviously that didn't happen, and here we are, 90 years later, still working our butts off. According to some estimates, Americans are working more now than they have in decades, by the way. Since the beginning of the school year, I recently estimated that I work about 65 to 70 hours a week when you add it all up. But I'm lucky. I love my jobs. All of them. And you're a big reason why. Thank you for watching.